My name is Taikia Wright. I am the CEO and founder of Right Choice Incorporated. Right Choice Incorporated is a internship and professional development organization. So we work with students from diverse backgrounds and help them identify internship opportunities and transition from school to work. And we have a niche in working with students with disabilities. Um, I've been in this field for over 10 years. I actually started the company straight out of college. Can you imagine that? So went from college, undergraduate degree in human resources with an MBA, and realized that when I was on the job market, I wasn't finding the jobs that I was looking for. And I was either overqualified for entry level positions or I didn't have enough experience for MBA degree required positions. And I realized that our students with disabilities need to be better positioned for life after college. So literally, I just started laying the foundation for what is known today as Right Choice Incorporated. And about four years ago, we had an opportunity to partner with Wright State University and establish what we call our campus-based model. And that is called the UACT model, and that stands for University Accessibility to Careers and Transition. So when we partnered with the university, we had an opportunity to hire Ms. Angela Bonza, who will be my co-presenter this evening, and I will let her introduce herself. Well, my name is Angela Bonza, and I am also a Wright State girl. I have two degrees from Wright State as well. My degrees are in the area of disability, and when I work with students um, located in our Office of Disability Services, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. We have a career services office, and they do a wonderful job, but I specialize in the disability piece. So how is your disability going to affect you on the job? What do you need to consider? What do you need to think about? And I work with our students and give them the individualized attention that they often need in order to be prepared to make that transition. So I've been with the office for about four years now, and, and it's been a great partnership. Absolutely. All right, so we're just going to jump into our presentation today. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask questions as we go along, okay? We have a pretty intimate group, so we can just have a good time this evening. So the presentation that we're going to do today is called I Qualify and the topic is understanding the job search process okay so when we look at the job search process the number one thing that you have to be aware of is promoting your abilities and we're going to talk a lot about promoting your abilities all right so the first thing that I think about when we think about the, the job process is the market and the product. So let's talk about the product just for a little while. When you think of your favorite food or that favorite something, what do you think of? And this is going to be interactive. Like what, what's that food that you eat that just, when, when, it, when it touches your mouth, you're just like, oh my gosh, this is the best. Italian food. All right, so Italian food is, is that it food for you, right? All right, how about yourself? Anything with cheese. Anything with cheese. All right. So that could be pizza, that could be cheesy fries. All right, anything with cheese. So when, you, when you're eating Italian food and it's just that perfect dish, can you explain that to me? Like, okay, sell me on the perfect Italian dish. Why is it so good? I mean, it just melts in your mouth and I mean, it's going to go melt into your throat. It's just good. Uh, it's like cheese, but it's very cheesy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know what it is about it. It's just good. Just good. <laughs> so that same feeling that you have about Italian food or about anything cheese, and you can explain that and get somebody else to get excited about even trying it, that's the same type of excitement that you have to have about yourself. Because in the job search process, the, you are the product, okay? So it's very important for you to be able to describe yourself in a manner where you want that employer to try you out, all right? So the job search process, the product is you, all right? All right. So you're the product. You definitely have to know yourself, right? You have to know your strengths. You have to know what you're good at, what you're not so good at. 
So in this process, we call this know thyself. You know, and there's a lot of career assessments that you can take. And like Angie said, when we work with colleges and we work with students, we really don't intend to reinvent the wheel. So we know that on college campuses, career services have different assessments that you can take to figure out what am I good at, what am I not so good at, you know, whether they're personality assessments like the Myers-Briggs or whether they're assessments like strength finders. Have you done strength finders before? Strength finders is great because it gives a vision and make it plain. So what you, would, what you can do is post that, whether it's on your refrigerator or on your bathroom mirror, something that you can look at every day. And every day you get closer and closer to obtaining your goal. All right, and if it changes, then write it out and keep it posted. But I think it's very important to have a personal career mission statement so that that will guide you through college and onto your professional careers. All right. All right, so when we think about the research and, and looking for different companies out there that um, are looking to hire recent college graduates, you know, a lot of times we have to do research. You know, you probably go on interviews and they tell you, well, research the company. Find out, you know, what we, what we are as an organization and what we have to offer you as a student, all right? You know, oftentimes we look at Companies, you know, whether it's big firms, small, small organizations, nonprofits, schools, and try to figure out, are these companies disability inclusive or are they not? That tends to be a, one of the questions that we hear often. And on the company side, I talk to companies all the time. I had a meeting with um, the, the COO of Nationwide a couple of weeks ago, and his mindset, he wants to know, well, how are we doing as an organization? You know, was it okay getting in? You know, did you have any parking concerns? So the companies are still trying to assess, the companies are still trying to assess um, where, where they are from a disability inclusive standpoint. So as students are looking for these organizations, companies are still evolving, trying to figure out how can we create a more inclusive environment, all right? So when we talk about research, and the research aspect of the job search process is the same, whether you have a, have a disability or whether you don't have a disability. A lot, of the, a lot of the different phases of the job search process is the same. I always say that people with disabilities just search with a greater intent, all right? So let's look at the research of companies. You want to research the industry that you're interested in. So you're interested in education. So you research education. You're interested in um, international travels. So you would, inter you would research Latin America and find out what they have to offer. Um, of course, we all know that organization websites are out there and totally accessible for, um, for students to go surf the web and find out all the information that you could ever want to know about a company. We also want to make sure that when you're searching for these organizations that you're taking advantage of student groups that may be tied to your major because they can also help connect you in either researching the company or connect you to an individual that would tell you more about that organization all right so when we're looking specifically for disability friendly or disability inclusive organizations there are a couple of things that we need to look for, and this is not at all an exhaustive list, but these are just some of the key things. <clears throat> One of the things is a website. A website can tell a lot about an organization, whether that website is accessible for individuals who are blind and maybe using screen readers. That can also tell a lot about that organization in terms of their level of commitment to disability inclusion. If they have an accessible website, if they've taken that step to create that accessible website, they are trying to create an accessible environment within their organization. Print material. If you look inside of your folder that I provided for you, you'll see a, a brochure in there. Although the brochure is a nice right choice brochure, <laughs> But if you look, that image, there's a person with a disability along with the other people on that brochure. So when you look at that brochure, 
you can automatically look and see that this is a disability friendly or a disability inclusive company. And there are a number of companies out there who have decided to include people with disabilities into their print and their marketing material. And not just on the employment side, but also on the customer side as well, because that's very key. I oftentimes share a story that um, when I went to Kohl's one year, I don't think, I haven't seen them recently, but when I went into Kohl's, they had a mannequin in a wheelchair. And I said, well, Kohl's wants my money today. <laughs> you know, but something that simple spoke volumes to me as a consumer, you know. And it didn't cost them any money. They just probably got the wheelchair from, you know, a medical supply place and just sat the mannequin in the wheelchair. But I wonder how much that did for their revenue in terms of being promoting an inclusive environment in their, in their stores, all right? So those are some of, some of the key things that you can look for. Also, power door, power door entrances. You would be amazed to know that there are still a number of companies who do not have power doors. And <laughs> I always use uh, banks as an example. Banks are horrible. I mean, you might not want to get that on camera. <laughs> but they, <laughs> that's one place that I, as a chair user, dread going. Because you go into a bank, they have, most of them have the wheelchair sticker at the door but then there's no power doors there. And then when you get inside the bank, the counters are yay high, you know? So I, they invented online banking for me. <laughs> Let's say that. But those are just some of the things that you can look for and be more aware of. Is this organization creating a disability inclusive environment? So those are some simple things. But we can dig a little bit deeper into a company and look at what we call Disability Employment Resource Groups. Um, and it's called ERGs for short, but a number of companies are using employee resource groups as a means of promoting diversity within their organization. So you can look at an organization like um, a Procter & Gamble and know that they have an African American resource group, they have a Latino American resource group, they have a next generation a young generation resource group. They have a women's in business or a women's in engineering resource group. So the new emerging resource group that is coming on the scene now is employees with disabilities resource groups. So if you can identify a company and see that that company has a disability resource group, then again, that company has taken the step to say, we are a disability inclusive environment not only are we trying to identify our own employee base that have disabilities, but we are projecting to the community that we are disability friendly, all right? And sponsorship of organizations and nonprofit groups in the community. Um, you can always look at various um, disability focused groups. Rob, you said you wanna work with people with disabilities. Look at some of those organizations um, those, those nonprofit organizations find out who are their sponsors because if they're nonprofit, they probably have corporate sponsorship. And if you look at those corporate sponsors, a lot of times those corporate sponsors have a disability inclusive initiative. So that's their way of outreaching to the community to say, hey, Cincinnati or hey, Columbus or hey, Ohio, we are disability friendly. All right. So those are just some short, brief ways to identify disability-friendly organizations. And if you look in your packet, um, there is a page in there that talks about Ernst & Young. And if you review that page about Ernst & Young, do you have a packet, Andy? Yes. That page about Ernst & Young shows in many, many ways that Ernst & Young is committed to disability inclusive environments from an employee base and from a consumer base. So all those different categories that Ernst & Young has listed, whether it's creating a disability affinity group, and I think it's called Accessibilities, whether it's creating a totally accessible website, whether it's um, promoting their products and services to the disability community, 
also making sure that their management is trained on disability inclusion. Those are all key components inside the internal environment that demonstrate that that company is disability friendly. All right? And also, up on the screen, there's a magazine called Diversity Inc. And Diversity Inc. produces the top 10 companies for people with disabilities. And they produce that every year. So you can just Google Diversity Inc. top 10 companies for people with disabilities. And I believe that list is released every summer. And I can tell you that Procter & Gamble is on that list every year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Arsene Young is headquartered out of Cleveland, I believe. Mm -hmm. Their individual that's over um, their accessibility division. I'm not I'm not sure where she's based. She's not based in Cleveland, though. Um, but she actually works virtually. They have a number of their um, their team members that work virtually as well. All right, so we understand our personal mission statement. We understand um, our strengths and what we're looking for. We understand a couple of different places that we can go to look for these disability-friendly organizations. We know some buzzwords, some, some key things to look for. So now we want to venture into our career exploration phase. And our career exploration, has anybody done internships yet? Internships, have you done informational interviews? An informational interview is where you actually find someone in that industry and go and interview them instead of you interviewing, them interviewing you. What internship did you do? Um, I was for a research lab. Okay. Okay. So based on your reaction, it seems like that internship really solidified what you wanted to do. All right. Have you done any internship in this one? Okay. Now, how did that relate to your personal mission statement? Okay. Sure. Good. Where's home at? Okay. The Dayton area. Awesome, just down the street from us. <laughs> so although that wasn't related to your personal mission statement, that also gave you an outlook to find out what's, what's it like in corporate America and just give you some extra set of skills underneath your belt. And that, that's awesome. Internships are a means of figuring out, is this definitely what I want to do? Or you know what, this is, is not it for me. And that constitutes as a good internship as well, all right? So your career exploration activities are job shadowing, you know, going to see and just shadow someone in that particular industry. You know, internship opportunities are very key. Informational interviews are very, very key. If you have someone that is in your particular field and you just want to understand what was their journey to get to where they are, it's always good to interview someone else to figure out what were some of their pitfalls, what were some of their successes, you know, how can you continue to position yourself for greatness, all right? And volunteering, volunteering. Volunteering is very, very key in your whole school to work transition process. It gives you a sense of community, but it also gives you a sense of understanding how nonprofit organizations work and operate. And of course, this generation is more, um, more committed to volunteerism. So making sure that you can put leadership activities on your resume as it relates to volunteerism is outstanding. All right, I'll let Angie talk about the resume. So um, your resume gets you the interview. The interview gets you the job. So we wanted to talk a little bit, this isn't a resume workshop today, but we wanted to talk a little bit, just the key points, okay? 
And I have, I'm, I'm, I'm big on the internet and I read everything. And I found a different resume for Harry Potter and I hated it. And I said, I'm going to rewrite it and I'm going to do it much better. So I did this as an example, okay? We have our contact information, that's very important. Our objective, when you're using an objective on your resume, you wanna make sure that you're telling them why you're good for them. I get a lot of resumes that say, well, I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I want to learn this. No, your objective needs to be what you can do in order to benefit the person who is receiving your resume, okay? Your education. You're in college now because you know that education is important for you to reach your goals. And so some key points about your education, relevant coursework that you may have had, um, leadership positions, other positions that you may have held on campus, those are all things that are going to be very helpful to you. Your extracurricular activities, okay? When you're involved, employers see that and they see you as more than just someone who went to class and got the grade. You were involved in your community, you're involved in different things, so that's very key. You might speak other languages, okay? You said that you were very interested in Latin America. Do you speak Spanish or Portuguese? I speak Spanish. Do you speak Spanish? Okay, so make sure not only that you speak Spanish, but what is your level? Are you fluent? Are you conversational? Can you read, write, and speak? Those kind of key things are going to be very important, especially if you're going to be working with people who native speak Spanish as their native language. And then your experience and achievements. You know, you got to start with those key action verbs. You want to be very detailed. Make sure you get a lot of things on there. One thing I want you to be careful about is those tells. Okay, you guys play poker, you know what a tell is? When somebody's trying to hide their cards, and, but they make like a little twitch or something that you know that they have something in their hand. Okay, so for Harry Potter, it was parcel tongue, okay? That is a mark of a dark witch or wizard, and so that might not be something Harry wants to put on his resume. I had a resume just this yes, week, yeah. just this week when I was putting this together on my desk and the young man had been in a very serious motorcycle accident and he had lost the use of one of his arms. And he put a paragraph on his resume about the accident and how he lost the use of his arm and, and all this, that, and the other thing. And I said, you know, I understand your need to want to be upfront and honest with the employer. I understand that. But the resume is not about what you can't do. The resume is about what you can do. I can teach you how to address the fact that you have lost the use of one of your arms in the interview. Your resume is for them to know what your background is, what your experience is, what your education is. That way they realize that you are going to be a good employee for them. Mm -hmm. So you want to be careful. And it's not just disability related too. I have a lot of students who are very involved in religious organizations, or GLBT organizations, and, and I'll tell them, I say, you know, you really need to look at this and decide, is this the, the image that you want to project to everybody? You know, if you're applying to a very conservative organization, you might not want to have all the things that you've done for the GLBT organizations on there. You might want to take that off for that particular organization. But if the organization you're applying to is very into promoting GLBT, everything, then that's something you definitely want to have. So making sure you're customizing and you're only telling what you want to tell when you need to tell it, okay? And your resume speaks when you can't because you might meet somebody at a, at a career fair or some other place, but let's face it, you probably only got three, four minutes with them and then your resume is sitting on their desk. They're not going to necessarily remember everything about that interaction with you. They need to see it on the paper. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so what are things that you really need to keep in mind? Most employers will look at it for 60 seconds or less. Okay, so you got to get them and you got to get them quick. The most important information on the top coming down. Succinct. I love the word succinct. It's a great word. Making sure that you are very concise and abbreviated and all the other synonyms for the word succinct. Pay attention to details. Oops, I made some mistakes in there. 
you do not want any kind of spelling, grammatical errors on your resume. That's going to be a big red flag for the employers. And you want it easy to read. You don't want crazy fonts that the employers have to sit there and look at it. Or worse yet, you email your resume to the employer and their computer can't read your font. So your thing comes up as gibberish. What are the company needs? Okay, again, that customization. You know, you said that you um, did an internship at a preschool, but have you done other jobs? Yeah? Have you done just the regular every day? You know, I, I work at McDonald's or whatever, something like that. Okay, so if you're applying for a teaching type position and you're applying for a service type position, your resume is going to look really different. So make sure that you're targeting the company's needs. They might love the fact that you go to Miami and you have great grades, but it means nothing to them. They don't need your degree in order for you to do that job. So that relevancy, making sure that the information you're putting on there is relevant and customizing it for everybody, okay? Even if you're going to a career fair, I always tell my students, look at who's coming. Make a resume for each of them, but make sure the appropriate one gets the right resume. <laughs> so how many of you would like to share with us your email address? You, what's yours? Oh. Okay. What's your, do you have a personal email address? What's that one? That's the one I was looking for. <laughs> do you, what, what's your personal email address? Say that what? Say that one more time. Okay, so you have a good one. I was laughing the other day because my niece, who's 12, um, her email address is kkswag2010. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, little 12-year-old girl. But email addresses are very, very key. You know, you want to make sure that you have that professional email address because, believe me, being in this business for over 10 years, we've seen all kinds of email addresses come through. My favorite are the ones, um, oh, I just saw one the other day, it was like Jose Cuervo or something like that. I'm like, you need to get a new address. <laughs> I'm not even making an option anymore. No alcohol there. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to make sure even those little details are addressed in your resume because the employers are looking for those. All right, another component of your resume is what you list and underneath your experiences, those bullets that we have to tell what we did at that job, you know, whether we worked with the kids or we taught them different languages, that is the area that employers are looking to to find out what are your skills, knowledge, and abilities. And we want to take that component and make a shift. We want to shift it from being a task-based resume to being an accomplishments-based resume. Because, of course, a lot of the first resumes that are, that are drafted by students, you know, I worked at McDonald's, I cleaned tables, I served food, you know, but we want to make sure that we now are being able to look, we're quantifying what those tasks were. You know, if you, if you wash tables, well, how many tables did you wash? <laughs> okay, if you provide a customer service, well, how much customer service, how many people did you serve? You know, if you're at McDonald's, you probably, in one whole shift, you probably could easily serve almost 100 people, depending on how busy that store is, maybe even more. So we really want to quantify what we do at the work site and make sure that we're talking about not only what we did, but our achievements, what were the results from what we did, all right? And here's an example of an accomplishment So this is an example of an accomplishment statement. Manage 50 marketing, marketing campaigns and budgets annually for mid-sized businesses, saving each company over $10,000 by increasing social media presence. Okay? So you're telling what were my goals, what, were, what, what did I accomplish while I was there. You're telling um, how did I grow those organizations and how did I impact. So it's not just a task list, 
but it's an accomplishment base. And that's what employers are looking for now. They want to see who are you as a leader, who are you on that job, and what type of skills are you developing at that work site. Okay. All right, networking, networking, networking. How, do you like talking to people? Do you like talking to people, Melissa? Okay. I like talking to people too. I, sometimes I get, get told that I talk too much. I definitely talk too low sometimes. But I love networking and talking to people and getting to meet people. You'll find out that meeting people and networking, that's how you go from, from one, one part of your life to the next part. And people ask me, well, how did you start Right Choice? Being a fresh college student, I always say I networked my way to starting this company because I had a meeting with this person and then that person told me to go meet with this person over here. And then voila, came an organization. But 80% of all jobs landed are landed through networking. So of course with the increase of social media, it's opening our avenues in terms of networking, whether you network face to face shaking someone's hand or you network on social media. So let's look at the different networking options. You know, some people don't like networking. Some people get overwhelmed in social settings. So social media will be a more comfortable area for them to network, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, or by scheduling one-on-one -on -one informational interviews. Um, if you're a shy person, you may want to volunteer and kind of do some casual networking. You know, I'm serving in an organization. I'm meeting people, whether it's a student group or a community-based organization, but you're networking. Sometimes you don't realize it, but you are, all right? You're building the, your network base. If you get overwhelmed by large crowds, you can identify smaller organizations to get involved in, to mix and mingle and find out what job openings are out there. How can I get more involved in this particular industry? And if you're outgoing and is ready to conquer the world and talk to everybody that you can possibly talk to in 24 hours, then using online tools and meeting people at different social events is the best way for you to go, all right? So networking is going to be key to advancing your professional career. You just have to choose what is the right networking platform for you, all right? So here's a list of a few job search tools that I will frequently um, encourage my students to utilize LinkedIn. Um, even if you're not ready to go into the professional world yet, you can start building your LinkedIn profile. Start by connecting with your professors. Um, if you've done your internships already, connect with your supervisors from that. And you can start building outwards. There's also a lot of groups on LinkedIn. So you could join some groups that are relevant to what your goals are. USAjobs.gov, that is for federal positions. There's also um, um, a subset of that for um, students. So it uh, promotes all the internships and the recent graduate positions. And people with disabilities, you may or may not qualify for what they call Schedule A. Okay, a Schedule A is a, um, a letter that is provided by your voc rehab counselor or by your doctor stating that this is a person with a disability and they are likely to succeed in the position that they're applying for. And that can help you apply for non-competitive positions. The federal government is supposed to have <laughs> a 2% um, rate of people with disabilities in their, in their organizations. They're not there. They are not even close to 2% yet. So sometimes having a scheduling letter can really help you. And there's a lot of information, if you go to USA Jobs, about Schedule A applications, OK? Um, you're welcome to contact me afterwards. And I would be glad to share any information that I have about Schedule A and a lot of samples that I have from them. Ohio Means Jobs is a really nice tool that I like a lot. It um, kind of pulls in Monster and the newspapers and everybody else's listings. And um, they have uh, a connect, an easy connect to, um, none of you are engineers, but the Third Frontier. And there's also a section just for internships. So that's a good way to look for 
um, things online. Same with Indeed. That's a new one that, well, it's not new, but it's new to me. I learned how to use it recently. And the Workforce Recruitment Program, this is something that Miami could look at um, with career services or can join with disability services. Do you know, do you have a recruiter that comes? Okay. That's something that you might want to talk to them about because the recruiter will come to your campus mm -hmm. and they will interview students for probably a day for, your, for you to, when you're getting started. And then the students can then be placed into a database and then federal employers can go in and go and reach all these pre-screened individuals, okay? We have the recruiter come out to Wright State. Our recruiter comes for four days because we have a lot of students that they're interviewing. Um, and my 38 students that interviewed, all 38 made it into the database and already 13 have been contacted about summer internships. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good way to get federal internships. All right. So we've gone through the process of your resume, getting to understand who you are on paper, um, networking, different career search tools. So now we're at the interview phase. So because we've already established that Rob and Alyssa, you both like to talk and network, do you like to interview as well? Sure, okay. <laughs> Good, and that's a very good skill to have is not to be scared. So many people are afraid of the interview process. It can be a daunting process for some. If you're not, if you're, you know, if you're kind of reserved and shy and, you know, really don't like to communicate for those who are more introverted. Um, but if you're more extroverted, just look at an interview as a normal conversation. I'm asking you questions, you're asking me questions, and we want to see if this job works for the both of us. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the interview process. Angie mentioned earlier on the resume that you know it's not about what you want, but it's about the employer's needs and what they're looking for. Um, so you have to make sure that in the interview that you're talking about how you can benefit that employer. And the key component for you to prepare for the interview is going to be that job description. So you take the job description and then review it and figure out what skills do you have as a student or as a pre-professional and figure out how can I then transition those into my abilities and transition those into answers in the interview, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're talking the same language that that employer is looking to hear, all right? So when we talk about students with disabilities, people with disabilities, we always have to look at what are our rights as an individual with a disability. Are you all familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act? Okay, so we know that the Americans with Disability Act, Disabilities Act protects people with disabilities from discrimination, correct? So, and it's a huge document and it goes through several different categories, but we're just gonna focus in on the employment side, all right? And more particular, the hiring piece, okay? Bottom line is you need to be qualified right. for the job that you're applying for. I can't go up to somebody and say, I would like to be a pharmacist. Right. I have a disability, so you need to let me be a pharmacist. I don't have any pharmacy training. Nobody has to let me be a pharmacist, okay? So you wanna make sure that you do have the qualifications for the position. And you need to know what is in a reasonable accommodation. Employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations. Okay? But that means that you need to be able to do the functions of the job with some help. So for instance, if you um, have difficulty typing, you have difficulty spelling, things like that, you might use Dragon Naturally Speaking, okay? And that is a speech-to-text software, and it's very simple for an employer to install that on your computer. You could have a microphone at your desk, and you could sit there, and you can um, speak all the things that you need to say. A headset for your phone. If holding the handset is difficult for you or holding it for long periods of time, if you're something like a receptionist, then maybe a headset would be a better fit. Text-to-speech software. If you have a learning disability such as dyslexia, you might use text-to-speech software. So the computer is then reading to you what is on the screen. 
for individuals who are blind, there's a screen re reader program. Okay, and that's going to read absolutely everything that's on the screen so that they can use the computer as well. It might mean rearranging the office, okay? Normally everything's kept way up here, but you know what? For my office and Taikia's office, we're going to move it all down here right. so it's at the proper level so that Taikia can reach it, okay? So those are reasonable things to ask, okay? We can't go to an employer and say, I need you to knock down a wall and build an elevator right now. That's not reasonable. And it's also going to differ on the organization that you're applying to. A big organization like Miami University has a lot more funds than a small nonprofit organization. And so, although Miami University might be able to apply to um, grant some reasonable accommodations, it might not be reasonable for this other company because they don't have the money set that the, that the other organization does. How many employees there are. You know, sometimes we'll switch job um, duties, okay? So, you know, you're gonna put away all the, you know, reams of paper and then you're just gonna sit there and um, fill out all this. So we kind of switch job duties that might make it more accessible for a person with a disability. But if there's only two employees in the whole company, that might not be a reasonable accommodation. So before you go and get all gung-ho, like, okay, we're going to do this and you're going to have to do this because of the ADA, you really need to look at, one, what is the job duties? Can I perform those job duties with reasonable accommodations? Are the accommodations reasonable for the organization that I'm applying with? Okay? Those are all very important things for you to know. The other key thing, too, when, it, when we were at the beginning of this presentation, and we talked about know your, know your strengths and know yourself, also know what are the accommodations that you may need. You know, are those accommodations that you're receiving in, in the classroom, will those accommodations be the same in the workplace? So you also have to do a self-assessment to figure out what accommodations will I need at the workplace. One website that is phenomenal if you just want to do some research and explore, it's called the Job Accommodations Network. And it's JAN for short. AskJAN.org. Ask or just Google JAN Accommodations. And it is a very, very comprehensive website. And they probably have every disability that you can think of, but they also have fact sheets that go along with those disabilities that also explore accommodations. Um, accommodations that can range from someone that may have mild cerebral palsy to someone that has very severe cerebral, pal severe cerebral palsy. So whatever the disability is, you can probably find that on the JAN website and explore what type of accommodations are out there. I know when I went out there, I saw accommodations that I never even thought of for myself. So you may come across some accommodations that may work for you, may not work for you, but it's a good area to research and find out a little bit more about what accommodations you may need in the workplace so that you can then tell the employer, these are the accommodations that I may need, if you need them, to successfully accomplish your goal. All right? All right. I remember something. Right? Okay. No problem. Um, it is also important that you disclose your disability to your employer and ask for accommodations, okay? So you can't not tell the employer, for instance, you know, if somebody has um, a psychological disability and they become very anxious and they need to take more time to go to the doctor and they're not disclosing to their employer, the employer is under no obligation to provide a reasonable accommodation until the employee asks for it. So if you realize that you need a reasonable accommodation, you wanna make sure that you ask for it. When it comes to um, the interview process, I forget, I don't think we did that. When it comes to the interview process, if you have a non-obvious disability, we recommend that you wait until the job offer has been made. Okay, so if I cannot look at you and see that you have a disability, I would probably try and wait until the job offer has right. been made and then ask for your reasonable accommodation. That's perfectly legal to do. 
For our students with obvious disabilities, we recommend that you address it up front, and that way the employer knows this is what I'm capable of. I, <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> you did. That's okay. That's okay. Um, all right, so when we talk about interview questions, you know, one of the big questions that surrounds college students or just job seekers in general is how do I handle illegal, in, Ill, illegal interview questions? And that's not just for the population of people with disabilities. That's for various diverse people in their backgrounds. How do I, if you're, if you're an older person, how do I ha handle illegal interview questions? If you are um, an expected mother, how do I handle these types of questions? So let's kind of walk through, and there's no clear or cut and dry answer to this question, okay? Um, so what you want to do first is think about, and of course you're in the mode of the interview, the interview is, is on, so you have to think really quickly. What is that interviewer's intent? What is their intent behind asking that question? Sometimes it could be a casual conversation and they just want to, you know, know, know a little bit more about you. So it may come off as, oh my gosh, they shouldn't have asked me that. But their intent behind it was just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, so you have to try, to try to evaluate what is that employer's intent behind asking that question. Then you want to decide, okay, they've asked me a question that I don't think is too appropriate. How should I respond to that question? You need to figure out whether is your goal to get the job or is your goal to help change the interview process? And I know these are a lot of questions that you got to think, right? Think on your toes because you're in the midst of the interview, but you've got to be prepared. So if that, interview, if that question comes, you have to figure out, do I want this job bad enough that I'll either casually answer the question or I'll stop and say, you know what, I think that was not an appropriate question to ask. So you have to figure out, do I want that job or do I want to change that person's interview process? Um, and if you think that you've been discriminated against in the interview setting, then there's always an organization called the Equal Employment Opportunity Center that you can call and file a complaint to say, you know, I think I've been discriminated against, and they're going to walk you through a whole process that you have to document what you went through, document your situation, but you have to figure out what is your goal in that process, okay? When we think about different responses to interview questions, that may um, not be the appropriate ones. A good one that I like and that I've recommended for students to use is just kind of look at the employer and say, you know, I don't recall I've ever been asked that question before. And then kind of look at the employer and that makes them kind of rethink what they ask if you've never been asked that question before. Or you can refuse to answer it, all right? And these are just some more example responses. If you're in that situation, um, you can always answer and say, you know, if they're asking you about how, how you can perform a particular task, you can always say, you know, I'm confident that I can perform the job duties that are required within this particular job, all right? And then the one that I just said, wow, <laughs> I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. And then, you know, there's always, the question asked by law, one cannot ask, so I am not comfortable answering the question. And this is a sticky situation because a lot of times you don't know whether that question is an illegal question or not. And sometimes you just have to respond in an instance. But again, you're protected under the rights of the ADA. So research what that means and understand that before you go into an interview setting. That way you'll be armed if you're ever asked or approached with an illegal interview question. All right? All right, so, and Angie talked about disability disclosure. And of course, it's to disclose or not to disclose. That's the question. And she talked, you know, gave the overview as far as the different processes, whether it's the interview or whether it's the application process. 
whether you have an apparent disability or you have a hidden disability. It really depends. Um, and like Angie said, you know, if you have an apparent disability, we recommend that you go into the interview leading with your ability. So you kind of, if, if I'm rolling into the interview and they obviously see me rolling into the interview, then I need to dispel any questions that are going on in their head. So I'm going to lead out with what I can do for the company, how I can accomplish the goals that the organization has listed on the job description so that I can alleviate any question that that employer has in their head. And like Angie said, if you have an, a um, non-apparent disability, then you want to wait until that job offer is made because you don't want to send up any red flags that may prevent you from getting that opportunity. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And by the way, but you know, when you're when you're given a job, when you're offered a job, and you're going through that hiring process, there's a lot of paperwork right. and all that stuff. And that would be a good time for you to say, "Oh, by the way, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the fact that I have dyslexia and I need to have a screen reader on my computer. I already have a screen reader. I just need to be able to put the software on. Who right. would I talk to about that?" Right. Okay. And it depends on the organization that you're, that you've just been accepted to. Some of them have a more um, process-oriented request for an accommodations, um, and some of them have to kind of figure it out as they go. But because you know what your accommodation needs are, then you're going to be very key in helping that organization accommodate your request. And it's very important that, again, that you know yourself and you know what your accommodations are. And I always tell a quick story um, about my pre-employment process when I had an internship when I was in college. I did an internship um, for the government and I went to a pre-orientation day and, you know, kind of like kindergarten, you know, meet your supervisor, meet your teacher. So I met my supervisor and saw my workspace. When I came for the first day of, of, of work, well, there was a brick underneath my desk and there was a hook on my phone. None of these things that I require. So they, uh, they just assessed me and said, well, our hands are a little bit different, so we're going to go ahead and put a hook on her phone. And well, she's in a wheelchair, so let's go ahead and raise that desk up by putting some bricks underneath. So my first day, I'm like, can you get maintenance or facilities to remove that brick okay and can somebody please pull this hook off the phone because I didn't need anything so you can't and we always educate employers you can't assume that you know what the employee what the employee needs so that's why the employee has to be vocal about their needs okay so I didn't need any of those accommodations where they just automatically assumed what I would need all right so nobody knows yourself better than you. And your needs may change as you're working, you know. Um, something may happen, you may develop psychological disability, you might be injured at some point. Um, and so even though you might not need any accommodations right now, when your circumstances change, you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you talk with your employer. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do that, but just be aware that um, you know if your work begins to suffer because right. you haven't started using any accommodations yet, you're not protected at that point because you have not requested anything, you have not told them anything. You might want to say to your employer, "I don't anticipate needing anything now. This is my situation at this point." I don't need anything, right. but I wanted to make you aware in case my needs change in the future. Yeah.
So again, that goes back to knowing yourself and knowing your rights as an employee, okay? So if you're armed with those two, then you, be, you can be successful. But you don't, like Angie said, you don't want it to get to a point where your work is suffering and you know, you're having different reviews and your evaluations are not where they need to be. And at that point you say, oh, by the way, yeah, my work is suffering because I have a disability, okay? So it's a fine line and you have to weigh which route that you wanna take, all right? And that's why this conversation is so key at this stage in your college career so that you can be armed with the information so that you can be more knowledgeable about who you are and how can you successfully transition from school to work.